Hello all and welcome to uh, this evening's uh, message and as we continue with our uh, journey having learned a little bit about woes to the to those that uh, were unrepentant and also understanding the spiritual uh, realms that we know that we are dealing with as well as the healing and the women who were ministering to Jesus it gives us a great opportunity to go into our next session and before we do so, looking at the famous parables of Jesus, let's open up our time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We just give this time to you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing throughout this world, Lord. You are touching the hearts and minds of every person who hears this message and others. Lord, bring them into a place of full restoration and divine healing. And Lord, as Jesus did speaking in parables, Lord, I ask that those that are, have ears to hear, and eyes to see, will be able to discern and understand the times and the seasons that not only we're living in, but what you said in your word and how we can grow deeper and learn from all these things that you said in your word about the parables that you mentioned. For your glory, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Right, so we're going to be opening up in Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 to 52. It's actually quite a long passage of scripture. So I'm going to encourage us as we open up our time that it gives us an opportunity to just go through it bit by bit, step by step and uh, honoring him and all these things that we do. Before we open up, I want to go through a message, a message in a future kingdom, a kingdom dynamic, which is... Uh, the message of the kingdom which we can appreciate. In this chapter, Jesus introduces parables as a means of teaching kingdom truths. Of the 40 parables Jesus gave, he made direct references to the kingdom in 19. These stories clearly relate to different time frames. Some impact the present teaching. Number one, the need for kingdom people to have e hearing ears. The breadth of the kingdom spread. And... Number three, the cost of the kingdom's acquisition. So number one, the need for kingdom people to have hearing ears. Number two, the breadth of kingdom spread. And number three, the cost of kingdom's acquisition. Others relate to the future teaching, which is number one, the final disposing of the fruit of the adversary's hindrance. And number two, the final disposition of the mixed ingathering from kingdom outreach. In mixing these two aspects of the kingdom, Jesus helps us appreciate the kingdom as both present and perspective. The message of the kingdom is two-edged and relates to two, uh, two frames of time. First, God in, his, in Christ is now recovering man from his double loss relationship with God and of rulership under God. He promised that this man's fall illustrated in this patriarchs and Israel's history, and now the king has come to begin, begin fully bringing it about. The kingdom is being realized presently in partial and personal ways as it is spread throughout all earth by Holy Spirit's power in the church. And secondly, the kingdom will be realized finally in consummate conclusive ways only at the return of Jesus Christ and by his reign over all earth. What we experience of his triumph now, in part, will then be fully manifest. This complete view allows for our understanding and appreciation and applying the principles of kingdom come without falling into the confusion of expecting now what the Bible says will only happen then. So earlier on we modeled the prayer and mentioned it. Your kingdom come, yours will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes we want to see that manifest itself here on earth, but it's according to his time. <laughs> it's quite a journey, because when you get a revelation, you want to just jump forward and just share the word with everybody, but their eyes and ears have to be receptive. And if they're not, all we do is we intercede, and we bring it to the Lord in prayer, and we ask him to do the work that we can't do, not by might, not by power, but by his Holy Spirit. Let's have a look at a couple of kingdom dynamics. But keeping in mind these three things. A need for kingdom people to have hearing ears. The breadth of kingdom spread. As well as the cost of the kingdom's acquisition. 
Verses uh, 1 to 9 in chapter 13 speaks of the parable of the sower. Let's go through that. On the same day, Jesus went out to the house and sat by the sea. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately are sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell amongst the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground, and they yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What's that talking about? He was talking about a pictorial illustration of how he could explain the kingdom of God and the words that are spoken into the person's eternal destiny in their heart. But it all depends on how we cultivate our heart, which allows his word to remain planted and grow deep so that it's able to flourish and bring much fruit. There were a couple of parables that we uh, mentioned or going to mention, as well as including the purpose of the parables. What were the purpose of the parables? 10 to 17 tells us that the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he who has who, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Oh, wow, what a powerful, 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 powerful statement. Directly from Jesus. Now, <laughs> whew, there's been so many um, occasions where when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you see things from above, not below. It tells us, look. Set your minds on things above and not below. And when you do that, you could be riding the same car with somebody else. And you could be seeing what God is saying to you and giving you direction, hence clues. And it's a bit of a journey, an adventurous journey that allows us to understand the nature and the heart of God. who loves us so much. And when he wants to deliver us from things, he can speak to us. But if our eyes are blind and our ears are deaf, how can we hear? How can we hear what he's saying? Remember earlier we spoke about how we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but sometimes the invisible realm comes into play. And when our minds are distracted by news articles or uh, things of this world, it sets our mind onto the things below, not above. At the same time, we know we need to stand against the adversary. We need to know who our adversary is. So yes, we do need to understand the struggles that are here on earth. But ultimately, when we are seated with Christ, which we are, we can see things from above, and he speaks to us loudly sometimes. <laughs> sometimes that can be totally misunderstood or thought of as bizarre or strange when shared with other people. But meantime, maybe God, like he did with Moses and Joshua, he was leading them. He was leading them saying, this is the way. Take them. But then it's a case of getting their hearts ready. Allowing them to appreciate and experience the love of Christ for themselves. So they can know that they're going into the promised land and they will be able to be led by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. This is where we have to discern.
Desired. What does desire mean? To set, uh, Strong's Accordance 1937, to set one's heart upon, eagerly long for, covet, greatly desire, lust after. The word emphasizes the intensity of the desire rather than the object desired. It describes both good and evil desires. So sometimes we may see things from above, but we see those that are on earth or yet to have that personal revelation. So as Jesus did, we meet them where they are. We connect with them where they are. We understand where they are, just as what Jesus did with a tax collector. And Luke, the physician, Luke just said, I'm following you. What about Mark and John? Great disciples. As we've been harmonizing the Gospels over these last little whiles, we're going to be just diving in, diving into more of what he has for us. The parable of the sower explained tells us that therefore, hearing the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he received the seed on the stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed amongst the thorns, he is, hears the word and cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful but he who received the seed on good ground and he who hears the word and understands it he who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundredfold some sixty some thirty that's saying that when we are hearing the word of god how he explains that to us is really revelational let's have a look at the parable of the wares and the, uh, the, the wheat and the tares 24 to 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and the time of harvest. I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Reminds me of the story of Joseph, how he had that dream. But what what this passage is, is, is sharing with us, it's dealing with the saints, the people who love God and are called according to his purposes, and the sinners. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. I just want to say that to start right out at the front. It's a mixed society that we live in, because once we were sinners, saved by grace. The, church, the church's responsibility is to cast the message, the gospel message, before all of society, realizing that will attract all different types of people. Some are redeemed, some unredeemed by the angels and the end of the sage. And in response to the disciples' affirmation concerning their understanding, Jesus likens them to a household able to integrate the new with the old. A disciple properly instructed is able to appreciate Judaism, which is the old, with Christianity, which is the new. Let's appreciate that for a second. Taking the new wine with the old wine. Sometimes you've got a beautiful wine and it's a new wine. It's got life in it. It's that fruitful tasting wine. The other one is old. But it's got that richness, that uh, special taste. And as with the Jud Judaism and those that are uh, born again new believers, well, they are able to be together. Allowing the Holy Spirit to bring them into a new wineskin. 
But it's as I said before, it's for him to do that work. And as I read earlier, we can understand that there's a mystery. There's a, there's a wonderful mystery that I've only just read a part of it. But I want to read a couple more. Let's have a look at the mystery revealed. So when we look at the old and the new and how this, the tears, keeping in mind this is the parable of the tears, we can appreciate that Jesus is doing something with the old and the new. As he said, just keep them both, let them both grow. And when it comes time to harvest, separate the one from the other. Because then you'll know which ones are his and which ones aren't. Ephesians goes into the mysteries. And it's a beautiful way that we can understand whose we are and why we appreciate the mysteries. Paul was saying, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how then by re revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not able to make known to the sons of men, as it happened now being revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gifts of the grace of God given to me by the, the, the effective work of his power. That's the mystery revealed that Paul was speaking of how he so lovingly brought that into the human experience and his mission, mission to help believers, Jews and Gentiles, accept each other as partners in God's covenantal plan, the covenantal plan of salvation. It was foreign to the Old Testament Jewish people, this um, salvation and this mystery. Not being understanding either by Jew or Gentile until Jesus came. That's when they started being having that revelation or that mystery being revealed to them. What about the purpose of the mystery? To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. Remember this morning we spoke of the heavenly places, not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers. What does manifold mean? Strong's Accordance 4182, which spe speaks from polis, which is much, and poikilos, which is varied, many colored. The word pictures God's wisdom as much varied with many shades, tints, hues, and colorful expressions. As a God of variety, he is still entertaining the human arena, displaying many sided, multicolored, much variety uh, uh, wisdom to his people and through his people. He's good, good God. He loves us dearly and he wants us to be able to understand according to the eternal purposes which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in which we, whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my, at my tribulations for you which is your glory. Paul was just explaining his tribulations that he was going through. The tribulations that he was going through that was causing him to go through all these um, hardships. The dispensation here, fellowship. Paul describes his driving desire to help every believer see the personal role each has in dispensing, which is spreading, distributing or administering the grander truth of God's purpose in his church. And the eternal purpose which sees Paul's, uh, Paul's uh, citing God's intent to display the church before all evil powers at his instrument to dispense through the earth what he has already accomplished in Christ our Lord. That is, through Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension. And then it goes on to talk about the appreciation of the mystery which we 
read a little bit earlier on. But being or becoming mighty by his power gives us the opportunity to appreciate these parables. <laughs> parables, it could be anything from talking about the, the, the parable of the sower or the purpose of the parables even. Mark also made reference to Jesus' teachings. Probably about a third of them were parables. A brief story told by a way of an analogy to illustrate the spiritual truth that sometimes uh, can be heard and seen, sometimes not. But the purpose of the parables is something that we can appreciate. Mark gives us appreciation into this in the purpose of the parables. But what then? He was alone. Those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Hmm, that mystery. When they turn and their sins are forgiven, that's the mystery. Strong's Accordance 3466 is to initiate into the mysteries. Hence, a secret known only to the initiated, something hidden requiring special revelation. In the New Testament, the word denotes something that people could never know by their own understanding and that demands a revelation from God. The secret thoughts... The plans, the dispensation of God, remain hidden from the, un, uh, the, the unregenerated mind, but are revealed to all believers. In non-biblical Greek, mysterion is knowledge withheld, concealed, or silenced. In biblical Greek, that is truth revealed. New Testament, uh, mysterion focuses on Christ's sinless life, atoning death, powerful resurrection, and dynamic ascension. <laughs> hmm. Luke goes on to tell us a little bit more about the parable of the sower explained. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are those ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and then in time of temptation fall away. Now the one who fell amongst the thorns are those, when they had heard, go out and are choked with the cares, the riches and the pleasures of this life. And bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. What a wonderful way of how obeying the Father was supremely important to Jesus. And obedience is the response of faith to any instruction from God. And although taught that true faith will always be manifested in obedience. One seeks knowing God's will and then doing it in faith. Appreciating that while we take these steps in whatever area God has called us to be, be aware that the fruitlessness or the fruitfulness of the word of God in our life is affected by our receptive and teachability. We can all learn something from that. We want to do great exploits for the, for the Lord. And then when we do that, we give Him all the glory, as where it always deserves to be uh, praised. But we have a responsibility, a responsibility and purity to what the Lord has given us, to walk in unity. I'll let you read chapter 4 in its entirety so that we may be able to complete our time here today. But there's a couple of things that's a good um, opportunity for us to learn. Pursue unity with diligence. 
as we continue our journey, let's continue pursuing unity with diligence and accept grace and gifts humbly. And to grow in ministry as part of the body, that's what we all do. Put off the old, put on the new. Let's speak that truth. Not the unbelieving word, let's speak that truth that allows us to know that we are living in Him. And when the storms come and they trial and errors and tribulations, you know, we know that we can be still and know that He is God. And even as Jesus did when He just rebuked the waves and said, Peace, be still. Even the winds and the waves obey, obey Jesus. But let's have a look at something that can help us appreciate our faith journey. Our faith journey is filled with all that God shows us, reveals to us, and even what Jesus did as the wind and wave obeyed him. Let's have a look at that passage of scripture. Now when he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, and the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was great calm. Little faith. What do we know about little faith? It's having a small faith, isn't it? One that lacks confidence or trusts too little. Jesus used the word in a variety of right uh, settings. As a tender rebuke or corrective manner. Undeveloped faith as opposed to our outrageous disbelief or distrust allows us to appreciate that faith is something that grows and can be matured and can be strengthened. If we allow him the opportunity to do that. The physical state of peaceful sleep without great tempest uh, and the nature. The disciples, they were fearful and they cried out. But he was saying, peace be still. Jesus has complete authority over the whole world. And in him we may be able to have peace in that same storm or situation. So let's cross over to the other side. <laughs> let's do it. Mark, Mark chapter 4. Verses 35 to 41. Have I got that right? So on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left their multitude, they took him along the boat as if he was... And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and their waves beat against the boat, so it was already filling. But he was in the sleep, asleep on the pillow. And when they woke him and said to him, Teacher, you do not care that, these, that we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind then ceased, and they were great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and sea obey him? Wonderful account of how Jesus contrasts the fear with faith and equates fear with no faith. Faith means to trust in God, trust in his helping power in a crisis, and help that is both present as well as active in Jesus. So where's your faith? Where's your faith? As Jesus rebuked the wind, peace be still. How, how is your faith when the storms come? Do you trust in him? Do you trust in his provision? Do you trust in his providence, direction? Let's go back to Ephesians 5. Important for us to appreciate not only the mysteries, but what Ephesians tells us to do in these circumstances. Now 
when things are going against what we have hoped for and what we have prayed for and what we had longed for in our efforts to honor him. Remembering that in our uh, source and the substance of unity is where we can appreciate what we learned a little earlier about how we can put, put off the old and put on the new, as found in Ephesians 4, which you can go read. But right now, I just want to go through Ephesians 5. So when you have that faith and when you have that peace, you are able to have that love. And chapter 5 talks about walking in that love. Walking in love, walking in wisdom, and walking in the light. Very important uh, appreciation. That sweet smelling aroma. The one that allows us to come in from the darkness into the light. Let's read the first few verses. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as it is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolishness talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Let's walk in the light. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the world, and walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful for even those who speak of things which are done by them in secret, but all things are exposed, made manifest by the light. For whatever makes its manifest is light. Therefore, awake, you who sleep, arise from dead, and Christ will give you light. Let's walk in wisdom. See then that you walk circumspe circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in fear of God. So when we speak of perfect love drives out fear, when we are having our fear for the Lord and reverence for the Lord, we are able to get into a position of love. Position of love, position of love. As we go into the next passage, there, I just want to go into a couple of things that will prepare us as we walk in wisdom circumspectly, cautiously, sensitively, and carefully. As I read, redeeming the time, capitalizing on every opportunity, and being filled, being filled with that life that he gives us. Transform, transforming relationships as well as having dynamic ministries, enhanced worship opportunities, personal prayer language, as well as psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Returning to our first love is paramount. Returning to our first love is that marriage. As we're preparing the bridegroom, coming back for his bride, as we're preparing, as we spoke about earlier, the different realms in faith, hope and love. Let's talk about Passages regarding Christ and the church. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or having any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, the man shall leave his wife, uh, father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now that can be quite uh, an opportunity for Christ to shine, but it also can be a place of misunderstanding because of the submission here. The submission is based on trust. And when we have trust, we are able to equally submit to one another. How do we do that? We keep Christ at the head, believe in his word and grow in our relationship with him individually and collectively. Now, again, as I've done in past, I'd like to just present our marriage here on earth, as well as um, eternal marriage being the primary importance. Women are never second to men. They're not second to men in general. The wives do accept their husband's leadership, but not, not to dominate. They must lead with mutual respect, caring, loving their wives. Even if there's that break in trust or break in relationship or break in submission, allow the Lord to work in and through that situation. Restore. He's all about the business. The business of restoration. The Bible doesn't talk about males over females. But the husbands accept their responsibility and their leadership role in the same spirit of self-giving and devotion that Christ has shown for his church. And sometimes that can be met with opposition. But remember, as David with David, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Let's keep that in mind, because we understand that marriage is a covenantal thing. It's a faithful journey. It's one filled with faith, hope and love. Marriage involves a relationship of mutual submission, talking about the family. All believers are called to live in mutual submission to one another. This applies in a unique way to the husband-wife relationship. The wife is called to submit to her husband as to the Lord, to respect, regard and deeply care for him. This points towards her serving her husband, honouring him and edifying him, building him up. Her attitude, according to this uh, terminology, as to the Lord, is to be one of the highest esteem and regard. In a matching, even more initiating and leading way, the husband is called to lay down his life for his wife. He is to sacrifice his own interest in order to enhance hers. His role is to nourish, to support her growth towards her own maturity and to cherish, to cherish, to warmly care for and attend to. In this way, each marriage partner contributes to bringing the other into their full potential. A marriage lived out in mutual loving environment mirrors the in uh, interactive love that Christ has for his church and his church is called to have towards him. Dear Heavenly Father, we just take this time out to pray for all marriages and we ask that you will bring your restorative plan and purposes for each and every situation. That you may be the head of that marriage and ultimately that our marriage with you is eternal and we keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, only by your Holy Spirit you can work in and through all marriages. So we put this at your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I just felt the leading of the Holy Spirit to just pray for all marriages out there.
the hope for marital health. Women in God's design. Within marriage, the companion, uh, the companion truth of mutual responsiveness to the New Testament elaboration of Genesis chapter 2 verses 23 and 24 is pivotal today. Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 32 reveals submission and cleaving as a bookends of the same truth. Because she was taken out of man, therefore the man or the husband is to cleave to be joined to his wife and she is to submit to him as her head, the source of the origin. Without both sides in place, the structure, the family, the church and society topples over. Furthermore, order is not all there is to the point. It is about relationship. It's about interdependency. And it's about God's original design. In essence, the man and the woman began as one in Adam. After the divine surgery, cleaving and submitting were the dynamic that would keep them united in relationship and function as they manifested the image of God, male and female, in the earth. Outside the marriage relationship, corporate submission to one another secures the dynamic of God's intended health and productivity of all relationships. Very important for us to hear that word for this time and for the season. In a world that's teaching us that marriage is not important, in a world that's teaching us that individuality and choices of ways outside of God's design is accepted and celebrated. But let me ask you this question. What does that do for the future generations? As I made reference earlier to Hosea, the book that uh, was so beautifully illustrated by God's faithfulness to an unfaithful nation, Israel. And even how their children were named as a point of not accepting. From a point of not accepting to a point of restorative plan of accepting. You are my people. God's faithfulness stood the test of time, even through the most difficult trials and tribulations that allowed him to show his faithfulness, show his love, and show his forgiveness for a, for a, for a nation, for a people that continued to turn away from him, turned away from their first love. So my prayer as we end off this time today and ending this time off with uh, all these wonderful nuggets found in Ephesians as well as uh, the harmonizing of the Gospels, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, keep that eternal marriage, bride preparation in the forefront of your heart and in your mind. And for those marriages on earth, there's some great wisdom that we can find in Matthew chapter 5. But we need to tune our hearts and our minds back to Jesus. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness shall be added unto you. No matter what your situation is, God can turn things around for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. But we do need to return to our first love. You can do it. He sees you, I see you, and it's an invite for you to come into a wonderful restorative plan that Jesus has for each and every one of us. So as we've gone through the different parables and how they were uh, examples of Jesus' teachings, a third thereof, of how Jesus explained these parables, and how they affected the people's hearts and minds. Think how the Lord is speaking to you. Sense how the Lord is speaking to you through parables. Whether it's through your daily journey, what you see and what you hear. Ask the Lord to open your heart and open your mind. And be receptive to his prompting. But the only way you're going to be receptive is to know who you are being receptive to. As we discussed earlier with... Um, 
Uh, Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, wrestling not against flesh and blood, is not the person that may have been the problem or the situation. We've got to make sure that we are looking out for each other, bringing one another up from glory to glory, be lifted up, be lifted higher. That allows us to be able to celebrate God in spirit and truth. So as we all go through these things in life that test us, trial us, let's be faithful. Because when we're faithful with a little, he'll give us more. And when we love much, we are forgiven much. And then we are able to show the much love that we have been given to others so that they may be able to love much in return. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We just ask that this message is filled with your Holy Spirit, your guidance of parables, teachings. Allow us to walk in the wisdom, the light, and the love that you have called us to, preparing our, ourselves as your bride for the marriage, because you're coming back for your bride. And Lord, as I prayed earlier, I just pray for all marriages out there. I ask for you to strengthen them, to hold them dear to your heart and bring them into your divine revelation so that if they've been broken, they may be restored. If they are strong, may they be stronger. All for your glory, all for your power and all for your might. We pray this in your Holy Son's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, lovely to be spending this time with you and um, take care and uh, be strong and uh, be courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Take care for now.